Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, we're about to get started here. I'm Eric Huberty. I'm one of the graduate uh, advisors here. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, as the, the information session goes on, you should see a little chat box in the bottom of your screen. Feel free to put questions in there. I will, um, if they're pertinent to what's being talked about at the time, I'll interject and ask those questions on your behalf. And then at the end of the uh, program, we'll have some time for a Q and A. Um, and so feel free to throw questions in there for that as well. So without further ado, uh, I'll let Mike introduce himself. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Mike Brett. I'm one of the environmental uh, faculty. I'm also a couple of different things, I guess. Mm -hmm. I'm the graduate program coordinator for the department and I'm the associate chair for educational issues in a department. Uh, and I'm also one of the characters in this uh, um, group of pictures here. So we have, let me count, we have 10 faculty in the environmental group. Um, I'm the first one on the upper left hand corner. I work with uh, lakes and eutrophication lakes. We have David Butman who works with a carbon cycle. He has a joint uh, appointment with the um, School of Environment and Forestry, Environmental Science and Forestry. We have Mike Dodd. He works with O's. He works with oxidation reactions and drinking water systems. Um, Ed Kologi who works with um, um, pharmaceuticals and other anthropogenic contaminants and what in the surface waters and groundwaters. Gregory Corshin works with um, corrosion and water distribution systems primarily. Tim Larson's uh, air pollution uh, modeler and uh, Julian Marshall is um, an uh, air pollution impacts uh, sort of person. He studies the impact of air pollution on different socioeconomic groups. Uh, Professor Rebecca Newman studies groundwater um, contamination, especially with uh, arsenic. Jessica Ray is our newest hire. Professor Jessica Ray just started in our department about a year ago, and she works with stormwater and uh, contamination of stormwater. Professor Kaminsky has been here for a few years. She studies uh, drinking, uh, not, she studies um, um, sanitation in developing countries, so especially sanitation in like refugee camps and places like that. Uh, um, how do you deliver that in, a, in an effective way? And Amy Kim does research on low impact development. And Professor Mari Winkler does research on um, the nitrogen cycle and is particularly in, in water treatment systems and nitrogen removal and animox. Um, I change my slide. Oh, so here we go. Sorry, we had operator error there for a second. So right here is a program plan for the, the professional master's program that we offer within master within the, the environmental group. And it outlines uh, a couple different uh, tracks you might want to take. Um, and it specifies the overall requirements. We're on a quarter system at the University of Washington, so it requires uh, 42 credits of coursework. Um, and uh, there's a, if it's just, um, not just, but if it's a coursework based only, it's 42 credits of coursework. If you end up doing a, a master's research project as well, then it's 32 credits of coursework, nine credits uh, that you get from your thesis. There's some requirements you need to get, you know, half your classes have to come from, or 18 credits have to come from graduate level classes. The rest can come from uh, senior and graduate level classes. You have to maintain a, a minimum GPA, overall GPA of 3.0. You have to get at least a 2.7 in every class. And we have um, three required classes for the two water tracks. Uh, we have two basic water tracks. One is water and engineered systems. And the other is water in natural systems. I'm more of kind of a natural system person. We have a lot of people interested in stuff like stream restoration. But, you know, probably two-thirds of the people in our program are uh, coming from 
uh, our, our interest in going into some type of engineered water treatment system like drinking water treatment, wastewater treatment, storm water treatment, something of that sort. Um, one thing about our program that I think is, is fairly unique and is a little bit different from other master's programs in this department is that we do attract students from many different backgrounds. So we have a lot of students that come from non-engineering backgrounds, geology, you know, uh, chemistry, um, environmental science, um, what other, oh, we've got lots of different departments that, that uh, contribute students to our, to, our, to our program. So we have, uh, it's a very diverse group of graduate students and, 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 and the, especially in the environmental group. Um, so some of the classes that we offer for, for people, um, one is class I teach, um, applied limnology. And that class focuses on, on eutrophication, the most common uh, disturbance of, um, of surface waters, of inland surface waters. And there's a picture of me collecting a sample from uh, Upper Klamath Lake in Southern Oregon, uh, which has some of the worst blooms in North America and is only about 25 miles away from um, Crater Lake, which has the highest water quality in North America. So we have two lakes that, that have the almost completely divergent water quality located about uh, 25 miles apart and one is connected to the other uh, crater lake discharges to Klamath. Um, then we have uh, one of our required classes is microbial um, process fundamentals taught by Professor Mari Winkler and um, this gives you uh, a very strong foundation on on what bugs do in engineered systems. A lot of, of the water treatment done in engineered systems is done by bacteria. And this class will teach you what you need to know about bacteria so that you can be an effective environmental engineer. Um, um, we also have a class on biological treatment systems. It's got Mari Winkler listed as the instructor, but the last two years we've actually had a professional engineer teach it, which I think is really good. They bring the practical perspective of actually designing water treatment plants, drinking water, I mean, wastewater treatment plants um, to this class. And uh, I think it's uh, very useful for the students to see kind of the firsthand perspective of how a professional engineer would um, approach these sorts of problems. Um, <clears throat> aquatic chemistry is another one of our core required classes. That's taught by Gregory Corshin. So that's gonna give you a very strong foundation in environmental chemistry. Um, I, this right here is probably the key core class in our curriculum. Most students say they, during the quarter, when they take this class, they spend as much time on this four credit class as they do um, their other, you know, classes put together. So they would take, you know, four credits of this and eight credits of other stuff. And this class is probably more than half the work that goes into that quarter. But it's a very important foundational course for us. Um, physical chemical treatment processes, also very important for understanding um, especially um, drinking water systems. Um, so that's also taught by Professor Corshin. Um, environmental organic chemistry is taught by Mike Dodd. Um, he's, uh, like I say, one of our, he's our, our, um, our big um, organic chemist person's department. This is also one of our, our core required classes. So our, our four our three core classes are microbial process fundamentals, uh, aquatic chemistry, and environmental organic chemistry. And then um, a graduate class is taught by me called uh, Lake and Watershed Management. And really what this class is, is it's uh, best professional practices for environmental modeling. So we teach students how to um, assess and vet in uh, environmental models to figure out whether the environmental model is properly characterizing the system it's being used to represent. So people oftentimes just pull models out of boxes and just you know start using them. And this class will help you develop the tools so that you would know whether a model is actually um, a fairly robust representation of the system it's being used to manage or, or if it's not, it's important to know that because if you're gonna spend a lot of money um, uh, managing a system on the basis of environmental models, you want to be fairly confident that the environmental model is 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 a is a fairly good representation of the system that you're interested in. Um, advanced topics, so that's uh, going to be taught by our newest professor uh, Jessica Ray, and I think at least initially she'll probably be covering a lot of topics that are related to um, some of the more innovative techniques that are coming out there for stormwater management. There's a lot of 
interesting uh, ideas on, on how to deal with stormwater. There's in the Seattle area, there's a huge amount of money being spent on issues related to stormwater. There's um, a huge push by both um, King County Metro and uh, uh, Seattle Public Utility, Seattle SPU, to um, deal with combined sewer overflows. And so both Seattle City and King County are spending about $1.5 billion dealing with CSOs in the next decade. So there's a whole lot of uh, infrastructure being put in place. There's a lot of research needed to, to support that infrastructure. And there's a lot of really interesting challenges associated with the, the quality of water, um, you know, the low quality of storm water and the low quality of, of, of these CSO discharges. Um, another class is environmental chemical modeling by Professor um, Rebecca Newman, and I mentioned her earlier. She uh, does a lot of research on um, the mobilization of arsenic in groundwater systems and in different parts of the world, but a, a lot of her work has been done uh, in Bangladesh where they have real major problems with arsenic contamination of groundwater systems. And so a lot of that has got to do with um, redox conditions and how those affect the solubility of, of different constituents in groundwater. So arsenic is much more soluble uh, in anoxic conditions. And, and, and so Professor Newman helps you understand how to represent that in, you know, using mechanistic models, numeric models. Um, that's the end of what I have to say right now. I wanna say a few general things about our graduate program that I think are worth knowing. One of the things that we're trying to do with our graduate program that I think will help out um, incoming graduate students is that we're trying to line up the coursework that we offer in our in our program so that um, um, graduate students can take all their classes either on Monday or Wednesday or alternatively take them all on Tuesday and Thursday so in some quarters we'll, we'll strive to offer all our classes on Monday and Wednesday and other quarters we'll strive to offer all our classes on Tuesday and Thursday, but within a particular quarter, we're gonna to try to offer all the classes on the same two days. And the reason that we're trying to do that is because a lot of the students that enter our professional master's program are working part-time in some of the local engineering firms. The job market in Seattle right now for environmental engineers is, is actually fantastic. I don't know else, how else to characterize it. Everybody's getting jobs. And a lot of people get part-time jobs that they do while they're, while they're in graduate school. They develop, you know, some, you know, rapport with the local firms, uh, get to know what's going on around here, and they want to be able to have their work week set up in such a way where they can focus some days on their, you know, part-time job and other days on their courses. And so we're working really hard to try to, to make, to accommodate that. And I think we're making some good progress. We're pretty close to that. Um, the other thing that we've done recently to help out graduate students in the department is that we've turned over our entire seminar series to be operated and run by the graduate students. And we've had a tremendous boost in the interest in the graduate seminar series now that we've turned it over to the graduate students. Um, they apparently are capable of picking much more interesting <laughs> seminar speakers than professors are. And so we're, we're trying to do some things to really um, improve um, the experience for students, for, for graduate students in this department. So that's what I have to say for now. Um, now, Professor Erkan Istanbuli is going to speak about the, the hydrology and the hydrodynamics group. Okay, I'm not muted, right? Am yeah, I? You're good. Okay, good. Okay, um, hello. Um, um, my name is Erkan Istanbuloglu. I'm a professor in, in this department. Um, I'm in the hydrology and hydrodynamics uh, area. So this is uh, essentially that we have five, uh, ten uh, faculty in the hydrology and hydrodynamics area. Alex Horner Devon, Alex Horner Devon is in hydrodynamics, and he works on uh, he studies plumes in rivers and estuaries. Faisal Hussain, he's a hydrologist. He focuses on satellite remote sensing, water management projects in. Um, developing uh, uh, countries. Professor Lundquist uh, works on, primarily works on snow and um, atmospheric <coughs> modeling uh, as related to snow and extreme events. And I am, I'm a, I'm a hydrologist and I work on mostly 
um, hydrological modeling, ecosystems modeling, and modeling of geomorphic processes in relation to hydrology and ecosystems. And I have a growing interest on um, in the built environment as well um, in the context of uh, net zero, uh, you know, carbon neutral uh, concepts. And David Sheen uh, is um, pro uh, Professor Sheen. He's uh, uh, is one of the uh, our newest members. Um, his area is uh, on uh, satellite remote sensing and remote sensing through uh, unmanned vehicles like drones and and other things. I mean, he has a great tour shop that I mean he flies drones and he collects a lot of data at less than a centimeter scale resolution. And he analyzes that the, the data sets with respect to changes on, on the landscape and so on. And the Jessup, Professor Jessup is uh, uh, in the hydrodynamics group. He focuses on oceans. Um, Professor Thompson, uh, also in the hydrodynamics area, and he's interested in, largely interested in harnessing um, energy from waves. Professor Nyson uh, runs the comp computational hydrology group. Um, he has a fairly large modeling group. Uh, he is uh, largely interested on climate change impacts on hydrology and water resources. Professor Kumar is interested in hydrodynamics modeling, setting up very sophisticated models to examine uh, uh, flow dynamics and sediment transport in rivers and oceans and, and, and coastal systems. Professor Newman um, is, a, is a sort of the joint member between our hydrology and hydrodynamics group in the environmental sciences group and she studies groundwater uh, groundwater contamination with respect to arsenic and she has a lot of interest in the globe uh, developing world um, our program at uh, um, the sort of a summary of our our program um, is that in our classes we focus very fundamentally on physical processes you would have a very sound physical understanding of the fresh water and salt water in general um, uh, within the context of, of the landscape and in different reservoirs of the landscape. Building on this sort of traditional hydrologic, hydrodynamics understanding, we also use uh, more advanced uh, methods like modeling, environmental observations, and monitoring in combination with modeling advanced surveying, satellite remote sensing, data analytics and cloud computing in our classes. You will see that some of these classes would be focusing on, let's say, satellite remote sensing and surveying, but some, of, some other classes would be using that satellite remote sense data for calculation of, of certain hydrological or hydrodynamic phenomena. And more and more, we start integrating data analytics in other words, sort of the big data science and computation in our classes. We broadly focus on global change questions, um, like growing challenges in the natural and built environments that occur globally, uh, within the increase of population and climate change. Um, we study freshwater resources um, across the globe. And we're also interested in, uh, in energy from uh, water and, and waves and sort of within the context of green energy. Um, with building on these um, um, solid background and modeling and technology expertise, you would also have a lot of interactions within student groups. Students here work closely with faculty. We have one-on-one -on -one meetings with our students, whether you have a PhD student or a master's student. Uh, we always interact with you uh, on, a, on a weekly basis, essentially. And uh, we also have local professional committees, such as the American Water Resources Association and American so uh, uh, Society of Civil Engineers student chapters that focus on hydrology and hydrodynamics um, uh, uh, field. And we also have uh, uh, U University of Washington Freshwater Initiative that is largely run by graduate students and professional master's students. Uh, and they have their own meetings, they invite speakers, they uh, organize seminars. It's a very uh, interactive group and live group. So we have a, a lot of interactions you know, to that end. 
there's a lot of opportunities. We have field trips. Um, a, lot, a number of our faculty does field work and they may require um, help with the field data um, collection and analysis. And there's also opportunities in terms of taking short courses from, from eScience. Some of our grants involve um, developing short courses on modeling, big data, sort of data analysis, and then so on. We work with eScience um, through those short courses. that are not listed in this presentation, but there's plenty of opportunities there through the Freshwater Initiative. This is a video that was developed by one of our professors, uh, Faisal Hussein. I'm not going over this, but you can play it so it sort of summarizes our group and, and our classes. So um, I'm trying to map our courses on this um, hydrological cycle. Um, we uh, have the, the physical hydrology and snow hydrology essentially looks at the from all the way from precipitation in the form of rainfall and snow. We look at snow melt, how the water infiltrates into the landscape, um, surface runoff processes, groundwater runoff processes, and so on. We take the water all the way from the mountaintops to the oceans in these two classes. Uh, there's the data analysis course that intensely uses uh, environmental observations with respect to water fluxes and other things and uh, it develops the, the basic concept of statistical um, analysis of water sources data and environmental data and builds on coding essentially uh, they're using python in this class there's a groundwater class that looks like the fundamental of groundwaters we teach we teach hydraulics of sediment transport so when the water gets into the rivers then uh, this class so takes the water from, from the tips of the channel network from the groundwater and essentially studies how the sediment is transported within, within the channel networks. And what is the role of, for example, rising limb of the hydrograph versus the recession limb of the hydrograph in, term, in, in the sediment transport and depositional processes. Um, we have fate and transport that was taught by Professor Newman. And this class looks at the um, conservative uh, or non-conservative pollutants, how pollutants and sediment moves in the systems, in, in fluvial systems. There's water management uh, course that, uh, that focuses on uh, the water management projects, managing reservoirs for residential uses, industrial uses, um, uh, and sort of gets into the concepts of programming like linear prog programming dynamic programming concepts uh, in managing um, and water resources uh, seasonally and in terms of reservoir storage capacity coastal engineering looks at a lot of modeling in the coastal engineering class that looks at how the coasts respond to the forcing from the ocean through waves um, hydraulic design course is more specific to um, application of hydraulic um, hydraulic design in urban environments in terms of collecting water for use, uh, wastewater uh, and sewer systems and storm uh, stormwater design, green stormwater uh, infrastructure and so on. Um, there's an advanced hydrology course with that, it, that that looks at the more advanced topics in terms of modeling and statistical uh, in terms of process based modeling and statistical modeling. Our program, if you're interested in the, the, thesis, uh, the professional non-thesis option, it is uh, largely oriented towards essentially solving problems in the area of hydrology and hydrodynamics. So it's practice oriented. Uh, a number of our classes have examples that are directly related to application. While we have very fundamental theory, we have very sort of basic applications uh, towards practice as well. And you can complete this within, um, you can do it within a year or maximum in two years, depending on your schedule, because some people may want to uh, work part time uh, and take classes in two years. So it, it would fit on your schedule. If you're interested in, in a thesis, master's thesis track, Usually it takes between two years, two and three years, depending on whether you need to do a, a lab experiment or not and how your results go. 
but usually uh, it two years and two, two and a half years was sufficient for a master's uh, thesis. A uh, PhD could take four years or five years, um, and it would depend on the research project. Like, I'm not going to get into the details of the number of credits because the Professor Brad already went over it. I don't want to go over time. But we, uh, in our program, and we have three main areas within the hydrology of uh, uh, tracks, three tracks within the hydrology and hydrodynamics, and that are hydrology, hydrodynamics, and fate and transport. You have core courses that we expect you to take for each of these. And there are 20 credit core courses that, whether you're doing hydrology, hydrodynamics, or fate transport, um, we, we, we expect you to take, or, or, or um, you, can, you, you may want to consider taking them. And the, these include uh, the groundwater flow course, hydraulics of sediment transport, data analysis in water science, fate and transport, physical hydrology, and either water resources systems management and quantitative water management. I mean, these are largely the hydrology, hydrology courses, but I see some of the hydrodynamic students in fate and transport students come and take my hy uh, physical hydrology course, for example, or water management course. So the program is very flexible, but you have a, uh, like the 20 credits that you talk to your advisors and we expect you to take. And a bigger list of that is that it, with, uh, with respect to the, the uh, three different tracks of these courses, um, this is the list. Uh, sorry, this is this is the elective lists, and these elective lists um, again, you based on your interest, you talk to your program advisors, and um, you can pick um, these elective courses in order to make up that um, 42 credit. And within that 42 credit, I think there's also seminar included in that too. And 33 credits is the coursework essentially that you have to complete. If, if, if you're doing a thesis, if you're doing a thesis, if you're not doing a thesis. <clears throat> then um, you just go up to 42. You go up to 42, including uh, one or two credits for seminar, right? Um, so in this list, uh, the, the yellow colored section is some of the electives that you can go and take from other departments. There are a number of electives from the Earth and Space Sciences Department, from the School on Environmental and Forestry, um, and, and from Urban Planning. Um, but but talking to your program advisor and based on your your career goals, I mean, if you come up with a course that you really want to take that's not in this list, that's totally fine. I mean, you can take um, you can take courses from let's say from computer science department if you're interested in more data science issues or or from the e science. Um, the, the advantages of uh, professional non thesis program is that it's you can finish this in less than a year or within one academic year if you really want to do it in stance and it's it's doable so we designed this program so that you can essentially finish it within a year but it caters to working professionals some students work and take classes um, so you could do one course for example per quarter or two courses per quarter and you can do this for within a year and a half or, or maybe within two or three years depending on how you want to do it. And it's designed to be pay per credit, so you're not penalized if one versus three years, if you extend the, um, the time frame to more than one year, you just pay for the course. And it's very flexible in terms of student, uh, so, so the program is very flexible, like I said, based on your interest um, and your schedule. There are a lot of opportunities, both within, the, within this, uh, the greater Seattle area in terms of work experience, uh, within the Seattle area, within the Washington state, and elsewhere, of course, um, there's a, a number of consulting companies like Brown and Caldwell is one, CH2M. But like Professor Brad also mentioned, there's a huge uh, problem with the stormwater management in this region. There's a lot of new project that, that, that requires um, new engineers and scientists. So there's, uh, there's plenty of jobs that are created in this region. And there's opportunities with the Army Corps of Engineers, U.S. Geological Survey, King County um, uh, in Washington, and the Department of Ecology. And there are some testimonials from other, uh, previous students that which we encourage you to read before you make decisions. 
Okay, I'm just gonna briefly go over the classes. The physical hydrology uh, is the class that I teach. Essentially, it focuses on the physical properties of water um, from precipitation to essentially the water gets to the uh, water uh, lakes and lakes and oceans. We look at all the processes. Uh, it's theoretical based, um, very fundamental. And I'm also integrating cloud-based computing in this uh, class because I have some project that relates to uh, computing using browsers. Uh, so we're, we're looking at some numerical model applications um, using code online. Groundwater hydrology, uh, Professor Newman teaches this course. Again, it looks at the fundamental groundwater transport and how contaminants also interact with groundwater transport. Open channel engineering is another fundamental course that we want our students to take. Professor Jessup is teaching, um, and it looks at the, the natural streams structured or man-made uh, streams in the built environment. It looks at the impacts of floods and flood control, studies fish passages, and um, they also look at more re recent events, uh, like they have stories of more you know, or anecdotes of the more recent events, and they, they, they sort of build some calculation analyzing more recent flooding events in this region. So it's very practical, but also at the same time uh, with strong theoretical basis. Hydraulics of sediment transport taught by Professor Horner Devine. Again, um, both natural and the man-made systems are um, examined. But building on the open channel principle, sediment is integrated in this. They look over uh, different sediment transport equations and their behavior in different systems and estuaries and, and, and where the streams meet the oceans. Um, I teach um, hydraulic design for environmental engineers. I think this class is becoming more and more popular. In this class, uh, this is very practical, um, solution-oriented um, engineering course, largely. And we look at the um, stormwater systems, uh, water supply reservoirs, uh, stormwater drainage systems. Uh, we look at pump design and green stormwater infrastructure. In this course, this is set up such that in every week we have a topic, let's say pump design and pumping. We all go over the, the, that topic, and in the end, we have a software that we use. So we, we're looking at like roughly uh, eight or 10 software packages. Um, in this class. And I, I talk to students, graduate students, and they find this class very useful. And they actually find it more, more useful than my physical hydrology class. Yeah. I didn't like that attitude, but I think that's fine. Water ways, uh, water ways for coastal engineers, um, taught by uh, Professor Thompson and Kumar. Um, I think they taught it in every other year. And it looks at wave dynamics, coastal protection and restoration. So it looks at the, um, the impact of waves in the coastal systems and um, coastal structures and the marine environment. Uh, Professor Kumar teaches a numerical modeling class on hydrodynamics. This one is fairly complicated. Um, they solve um, partial differential equations uh, for the movement of water, um, jets and you know the, the moment of sediment and so on in a very detailed, um, uh, very fine resolution uh, environment that represents um, sort of the domain in the, in the gridded structure. And they use like Navier-Stokes equations, sediment on equations, and so on. So it's a very good course if you're interested in modeling. Here's an here's some animation from a class project that was developed. Um, part, as part of this course. And it doesn't want to stop. Maybe it's because it's very interesting, right? You will have to do a couple of years here. Okay. Um, there's also fate and transport taught by uh, Professor Newman. Um, it looks at the, um, the concepts of uh, uh, contaminants and chemicals uh, that is being transported. And as the contaminants transport, they, some of them decay and others form and so on. 
uh, but it's a very good introduction to the fundamental physics, chemical, and biological processes that govern the movement and uh, fate of chemicals in surface water and groundwater. And she's got really great examples uh, from the past events that involved um, um, uh, transport of chemicals and outcomes in, in our environment. Advanced hydrology, um, I've been teaching this, but also in the more recent years, um, Professor um, Nyson started teaching that too when I started alternating with some other class. Um, and in this course, we have a very detailed description of the surface energy balance. Um, and we also have statistical models of the hydrological uh, stream flow for the most part and we look into flood frequency analysis. So this is largely a modeling course that, that looks at the processes, um, the physical level processes and the statistical processes. Satellite remote, sense, remote sensing uh, taught by uh, Professor Hussain. Very hands-on experience of using satellite remote sensing data. I find this uh, class very useful for my students who are doing modeling because through this class essentially, you have a very good hands-on experience of uh, collecting data and using the satellite data for hydrological calculations and estimating uh, flood inundation and, and, and flood risk analysis. Professor uh, Lundquist, uh, like I said, she's an expert in snow and snow hydrology. She teaches snow hydrology course. And in this course, they look at the snow um, dynamics, including the snow accumulation and sublimation processes and melt processes, distribution of snow um, in the fields uh, through winds and topographic impacts, and so on. It's a very critical course, especially for the Western U.S., where we have uh, large uh, fractions of our uh, water comes from uh, snow uh, from high alpine regions. Um, Professor Horner DeWine teaches hydrodynamics. This, uh, this course, like fundamental theories about uh, movement of plumes and sediments um, in, in, the, in rivers, uh, in estuaries, river plumes, tidal flushing, lake upwelling, and vortices, and so on. Um, you got a very fundamental view and a lot of data analysis in this one. This, this doesn't have so much of a modeling context, but heavy in theory and having using actual observations to interpret uh, measurements in relation to theory. Advanced surveying taught by one of our newer members, Professor Sheen. Um, this, this class uh, is a very interesting one also. Um, he teaches um, modern surveying techniques uh, using structure for motion, terrestrial laser scanning, real-time uh, kinematic GPSs, um, and I'm also involved with the project with David. I mean, he has all these gadgets that he uses um, to create micro topographies on the landscape and changes on the landscape. He also works with glaciers. He has a glacial time machine that he developed that he can uh, track the, the evolution of glaciers as well as the topography through some of the methods that he develops and also teaches in this class. So this is a, a, one of the uh, very interesting courses, uh, modern courses that we have. Like I said, there's a number of courses that you can take from other departments that you can explore these um, in planning um, your program of study. In terms of resources, we have uh, Harris Hydraulics Lab, if you're interested in hydrodynamics. Uh, there's a new NASA flume um, that's right on the right bottom right corner that, that could create waves and winds and currents. Uh, we also have a smaller teaching flume. Um, there is uh, there's the, 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 the flume, bottom, flume on the bottom left, or that, that's more like a basin uh, that is used for estuary experiments. Um, we have plenty of computer sources in our department and across the campus. And, and we also have seagoing resources in the Harris Hydraulics Labs, like the, the vessels to go out in the sea and the rivers to make measurements and ocean cruises and, and, and things like that for research purposes. Um, the application deadline, I'm sure Eric already have covered some of these um, through other communications, but the deadline uh, is 15 of December and the admission process usually takes um, 
like by mid March. And for prerequisites for H and H master's program, we like you um, have taken physics one and two, calc one and two, and fluid mechanics. We also teach fluid mechanics, so if you haven't done fluid mechanics, then you can also take it here. That's all I'm going to say at this point, and I can entertain any questions. Can I add, can I add something? Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, um, I, wanted I wanted to add something about uh, prereqs pre as well for uh, people coming in coming into the environmental in. program um, from a field other than environmental or civil engineering. Um, for students that are coming from other non-engineering fields, um, we like to see them take a class that has a focus on mass balance and also a class that, that focuses on fluids. And we offer both of those in our department. We offer mass balance classes all three quarters. We offer fluids all three quarters as well, or at least two quarters. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you were to come into this department from a, from a non-engineering background, we'd, 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 we would um, uh, require that you take those two classes just so that you get kind of on track with the kind of classic ways of, of, of approaching environmental problems. So from environmental engineering, I would say the foundation of environmental engineering would be mass balance mass and energy balance and so you really need to learn that topic so that would that would be our prereq if you come from an outside field great so now if you have questions feel free to type them in the chat um we'll be taking them for a little bit uh to get us started one question that's come up a lot this week is if a student is interested in a phd research track do you recommend and they don't have a master's degree already do you think most students are best served applying for a master's thesis uh, option and then stating that they have an intent to continue on to a PhD here or elsewhere? Or do, does your group um, accept straight PhD candidates? So um, the, the first point I would make about this question about whether you'd try to pursue a, um, a PhD track or, or the master's track is that there is a lot more interest in our graduate program than there is funding available to support PhD students. So not everybody that wants to come into our pro program could be supported on a funded project because there, there aren't enough projects. But it's um, a very good idea to indicate your interest in ultimately doing um, a PhD project. To be completely honest with you, professors like people that want to do PhD projects because it provides opportunities for us to have you know grad students to collaborate with and especially phd students will be around for a while so um we have you know the opportunity to work with uh, somebody and train somebody over a period of you know let's say four years and 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 so that's very advantageous for professors so professors are, are always looking out for good phd students and they'll recruit them coming straight in the door another thing that does happen is a you know it's 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 common for professors to recruit PhD students out of our, our current pool of professional master's students. If somebody has a student in their class, it really seems like they're enthusiastic about a topic that the professor has funding for, then that might be the best fit for the project. And that happens a lot. I would say, I don't know, maybe half our students get yeah. recruited out of the professional master's program. But you know, not all of them, not all the professional master's students end up doing uh, a funded research project and uh, you know a fair fraction of them don't want to because they come here and they want to get um, uh, out into the job market as quick as possible and the easiest way to do that is to come in here and, and to finish up in three or four quarters um, or you know finish up in two years and work part-time is, is, is a very common scenario for the students that come in here. So both options are available you know, if you ultimately do want to do a research project, then the best advice is really to get to know the professors and find out what kind of research they're doing and look for opportunities that really line up with, you know, your interests and the project that's available. And also fellowships are available for PhD students, departmental fellowships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are, so, there are also the department fellowships to support graduate students. Yeah. Um, we have a question here um, asking about GRE scores. I can speak to that. Um, we do currently require the GRE. Uh, the test needs to be taken before December 15th, um, but the scores can come in a little after that. Usually it takes a little bit of time to process the application. So 
you should take the the GRE bef about a week, at least a week before the deadline. Um, but you have up until that point. Um, I can answer the second yeah. question. So the question the question is, how can we learn about other groups in the CE department beyond hydrology? Okay, so I'll, I'm, I'm the graduate program coordinator, so I'll talk about the various tracks that we offer in this department. We, you know, civil engineering departments tend to be pretty diverse, and so we are offering master's degrees. Uh, in uh, um, a wide variety of fields. The largest group is structures. Uh, the second largest group is environmental, but we offer um, graduate degrees in structures, geotech, transportation, construction, environmental, and hydrology. The environmental and hydrology groups overlap quite a bit, which is also the reason that uh, Professor Istanbuli and I are speaking at the same time. So students in those two groups often take classes across groups. There's not too many structure students that would take an environmental class. That's not going to happen too often. Um, but you know, we do have the six areas. Two of the areas are very closely aligned, I would say. Um, um, but if you go to the department website, you can find information for all six areas. And um, and if you have any questions about that, that's something that Eric could help you out with as well as directing you to more in, uh, additional information. Yeah. So this is also a good time to remind you that. Um, we have a general graduate advising email address. It's C-E-G-I-N-F-O, C-E-G-I-N-F-O, um, at uw.edu, and that's monitored by me and the other graduate advisors. So if you have good questions for, you know, process things, we can answer that. If you have good questions for um, uh, kind of more content areas, we're happy to forward that along where we don't have the answers. Um, yeah, so there's... Yeah, yeah, there's a there's a question here about um, international students and TOEFL scores, which is English proficiency. If you have a degree at the time of that you would start the program, so um, in this case, autumn 2020, um, from a U.S. university or a university where the primary the the language of instruction was English, you don't need to take the TOEFL exam. So as long as um, by you know. August, you have a, a degree, either bachelor's or master's from uh, a, one of those universities, you should be fine. Um, I can't answer this one. Yeah, so this it? question is, are there students who have gone from non-engineering undergraduate programs to your PhD program and have successfully attained engineering licensure after graduation? Uh, yeah, many. Yeah. Uh, I would say most of the graduate students that come into our program from a non-engineering background are doing it because they want to ultimately end up with engineering accreditation. Um, and so I, I, I would say most of them do that. Yeah. That, that, and once you've got, obtained a master's degree from this department, you're qualified to take all the engineering exams. Um, you know, you can take your fundamentals of engineering exam while you're still a graduate student. And then, you know, your PE requires a professional engineer's license requires some years of experience, but that's absolutely possible. And, and I think that's the main reason many students come into this program from a non-engineering background is that they want to get that engineering um, licensure, licensing. Okay, incoming students without, okay. For incoming students without an engineering background, would the two prerequisite courses need to be taken first quarter of the program before commencing the core classes? In hydrology. Is that like the fluid mechanics? Yeah, yeah I think, I think so. so. I, I think, think we, we would encourage you to take them fairly early on. Um, so the first quarter would be yeah, ideal, but you, you could, could probably take some of the hydrology classes at the same time, time I, believe, yeah, I believe. Yeah, you can take it at the same time, or you can, I think there's a way that you can also audit that course because that's a 300 level course. We just want to make sure that you have some uh, background in fluids in hydrology. And in hydrology and in open channel and hydraulics of sediment transport, we do have uh, we actually teach hydrology, hydraulics, but in fluid mechanics, you have a sort of a, sort of a more fundamental background. So, so I, some, some students, students do audit that course, some students, students take it um, in combination with other courses. Um, but there's a, there's, there's a way that we can work around that, I guess. Um, yeah, so uh, we encourage that you essentially come and talk to us and if you have a situation like that. And like Professor Brett said, we had a lot of students from non-engineering background who came to the department and who studied H&H &H or, or um, 
environmental sciences, and we find ways to teach them fluids. What about, um, so this is a question here, and please clarify if we're not getting this correctly, but asking about, you know, going straight into a PhD program from a different discipline. So I'd imagine maybe like environmental science or something like that, that doesn't have the engineering component. Is that something that uh, has been done in either of your two groups? You can skip the master's in this department. Most students get the master's along the way because to get a PhD requires um, 60 credits of coursework. Uh, yeah, 54. 54 credits of coursework. And so that 54 credits of coursework would cover the 42 credits of coursework that you would need to get uh, a master's degree. So what usually happens is students that are doing a PhD, I mean, sometimes the students who are doing a PhD will do a research master's as well, um, but it's also common that what they'll do is, is when they get 42 credits into their coursework, they'll get the coursework master's and then they'll just continue on and, and do the research PhD. So most students don't completely skip the master's, but if you want to, you could. It would just be a matter actually of not filing the paperwork yeah. to get the master's. Yeah. Some departments on this campus skip the master's and go straight to the PhD, but I would say, would say maybe 90% of the students in the yeah, PhD also get a master's. Yeah. And it's always to the benefit of the student just to have an extra yeah. degree uh, associated with you, and because it's a part of the requirements, um, it is certainly something yeah. that There is no extra time or cost associated with getting a master's along the way towards a PhD. No, it's just the paperwork that you need to fill out. And if you're interested in a master's thesis, Perhaps, I mean, you may be working on a project and you, you have your first paper and that, that could become your master's thesis paper. You publish, publish the paper and you have a thesis on that same paper. And then you perhaps move on to a different project or continue on the same project and develop three more papers or two more papers and then you get a PhD out of those papers. I mean, our program is very flexible and Essentially, as long as you come here and, and be excited about the program, work hard, and want to write papers, like we'll, we we'll love you. We'll have you. Yeah. And we'll find some of the funding. Yeah. Uh, any other questions out there? Uh, any last words of wisdom from the two of you? Uh, I think also there's the data science option. For oh, yeah. PhD programs too. Yeah, so there's a new thing going on. And do yeah. either of you want to talk about it? I'm happy to talk about it too. Well, we talked, I mean, in our hydrology and hydrodynamics program, I talked about uh, Professor Sheen. Um, uh, on, uh, he's an expert in application of data, of big data sets yeah. in terms of representation of you know, the geospatial variables of data. So he uh, pioneered a data science option. And how it works is that um, you, we have some departments, of course, that can come towards the data science option. And you take, um, I think, three or four credits of data science courses. And two of them could actually come from this department, from the courses that you will already, already be taking as far as one of the courses. One will one be, be Professor, Professor Sheen's on geospatial data. data. And the other one was be, will be Professor um, uh, Lundquist's course on data, of data science. And then you take um, two other courses uh, from eScience. And eScience, um, a computer science uh, professor is going to uh, offer those courses through eScience. It may not be as difficult as hard as a computer science student, but it's, but it's sort, of a, sort of a, a version that is that more applicable for, for engineers and scientists who are dealing with data. data. So, so I think that, that would be an exciting option um, this starting in the next, uh, next year. I, I can answer the next question from Rico. Um, Rico asks, I'm really, or states, I'm really interested in water quality, water reuse, and recycling projects which professor will be the best to be in contact with. Um, yeah, the people that would do that kind of stuff would be um, Professor Jessica Ray, Professor Mike Dodd, Gregory Korshin. Um, I'm a water quality person, but more for uh, natural systems. Um, I'd also recommend that you look at uh, Professor Rebecca Newman's profile carefully. She does water quality more in, in, in groundwater systems, but for the more engineered systems, I would look at um, Professor Korshin, um, Dodd, 
and Ray, and also um, Ed Kologi um, has some interesting stuff that that would be um, that would fit in very nicely with this as well. Well, it looks like we are about to wrap up. So if you have more questions, again, don't hesitate to reach out to ceginfo at uw.edu. Um, oh, we got one more question. Uh, geomechanics? Yeah, so we do have um, about five or six uh, geotech professors. And so I, I strongly encourage you to look at, at what they're doing. Um, and, and those are uh, professors Joe Wartman, Steve Kramer, Pedro Arduino, um, Mike um, Gomez, and Brett Maurer. Yeah. So those, there are our geotech, and, and I would definitely look in there. They're, they're definitely doing some geomechanics. Um, not, I wouldn't say any of us in the, in the hydrology and hydrodynamics group or the environmental group are exactly doing geomechanics. Professor uh, uh, Becca Newman, does work in, in soil systems. And so there's a little bit of that there, but I would say look to our geotech professors uh, directly. And they're, they're a solid group of people have uh, you know some really interesting projects going on. And adding to that, in the hydrology group, we're also interested in um, sediment transport and landslides, um, rock falls and things of that nature that are driven by water or water pressure and so on i mean if you're interested in more geomechanics uh, in terms of um events on the, the natural environment and and watershed sediments and we can you can also send us emails yeah. well thank you both uh if you have further questions contact ceg info and i'm happy to uh relay that information thank you all for taking the time to join us and have a great rest of the week Thank you. Thank you.